Hi, everybody, and welcome to our webinar for today. So today we are going to look at the puppy trade, that's uh, the online puppy trade in Europe. What are the problems with it and how do we approach it with our solutions? So my name is Natasha Lee and I am from the Animal Welfare and Wellness Committee of Wasava. So thank you again for to everyone who joined us. So we have a couple of very interesting presentation uh, lined up for you for this next hour. But first, I would just like to go through very briefly about the Animal Wellness and Welfare Committee. So our main objective is really is to promote animal welfare. And we do this through trying to engage with the veterinary community and getting the veterinary community to make sure that animal welfare is an everyday consideration. We also do this through collaborations with international partners. And that is why today we have Four Paws and also Fukawa, who is here with us to help with this presentation. I would like to also thank our main sponsor and our main partner, the Pirina Institute, for help, uh, helping the committee and allowing for this webinar to happen. So WSAVA represents more than 200,000 veterinarians across the world through 115 member associations. In 2019, we did an interview survey with them to see what are their animal welfare concerns. And we have quite a number of lists of different animal welfare issues and the pet trade is identified amongst one of the more important issues uh, of concern especially amongst our European members. And that is why today we are having this webinar. So we are partnering with, again, uh, Four Paws and Fukawa to bring you this webinar on the illegal online puppy trade in Europe. We have three, presentation, three presenters today. So we have Dr. Catherine Pollack, who is also in our Animal Wellness and Welfare Committee, but she's also with Four Paws as the head of stray animal care. We have Dr. Anne Creel, who is on the FIGCAVA board member. And the last presenter is Joanna Randall, the head of companion animals, uh, the head of campaigns, companion animals for Four Paws. So without further ado, I would like to uh, welcome the, the first speaker, Dr. Catherine, to speak on her presentation uh, to introduce you what is the problems and the whole, give you a bigger idea, the bigger picture of what the puppy trade is like. And I would like to remind everybody, uh, if you have any questions, please type it down. Uh, we'll attend to these questions at the end of all the three presentations and we'll come to come back to your questions to answer them. So please type it down. So Catherine Pollack, the floor is yours. Great, thank you so much. And thank you to all my veterinary colleagues out there for joining uh, to discuss this, you know, rather serious topic that affects so many veterinarians um, across Europe, but also across the world. Um, just a brief introduction about myself. Um, I, I do kind of wear two hats, so to speak, particularly in the veterinary community, which I sit on the animal welfare committee as well with Dr. Natasha Lee, but I also um, in my, in my full-time job work for international animal welfare charity for paws, which is very active on uh, dealing with the issue of the puppy trade, specifically in Europe. And so I'm really happy as well to have my colleague, Joanna Randall, joining this as well to talk about the work that's being done and some of the progress being made. So to go ahead and get started, um, a lot of you probably are already aware of the, the puppy trade and the sheer demand for dogs in the EU. 
And while these numbers are somewhat rough, there's an estimated 69 million dogs um, that are owned in the EU. And from that data, from avail available data, we can extrapolate that every year there's a demand of approximately 6 million dogs across the EU. Um, but the numbers don't really add up because when we look at how many dogs are being bred um, under the umbrella of FCI and the UK Kennel Club, that number comes out to only 1.1 million puppies. So we see a demand of 6 million dogs, but we know that only about 1 million dogs are being bred under this you know, umbrella of, of responsible uh, breeding. And so it leaves this big question of who is supplying all the puppies to actually meet this demand. And so when we look at where are all the dogs coming from, you know, there, there's several options here. They could be coming from private registered or licensed local breeders. They could be legally imported um, from neighboring countries. Um, but the vast majority we know are being sourced from illegal importation. So that's what we mean when I say the illegal puppy trade. Um, the puppy trade's largely considered illegal if it breaks any number of laws that are in place to ensure animals and buyers are protected. And that regulatory requirements are met by the people involved in the breeding and the sale of the animal. And the crimes committed in the illegal EU puppy trade usually revolve around four main areas. So there's certainly issues with animal cruelty and, and, and welfare concerns. So prevention of animal cruelty is generally legislated at the national level, but in the EU, it's based on the foundation that animals are sentient beings, and therefore member states shall pay full regard to the, the welfare requirements of individual animals. Certainly, we know that the transport conditions are very you know, fraught with welfare considerations, and in the EU, transport conditions are set generally by the council regulation, um, and we know that, you know, the, the long distance and very, um, you know, strenuous journey that these animals are on definitely are in violation of some of these, uh, you know, guidelines that are in place and cause injury to the animals that can cause unnecessary suffering. Um, in terms of consumer fraud, this is something, you know, we don't think a lot about in the veterinary community, right? We're very focused on the welfare issues, um, the issues that our clients have, you know, with, with unvaccinated and sick puppies, but there's also consumer laws that are being violated here. So if a, purchase, if a person purchases a product that has not been sold as advertised uh, and an agreement hasn't been settled with the seller, they can actually take a civil case for reimbursement for veterinary purchase costs against the seller. And so we know that there's a lot of fraud being committed, particularly in the online trade of, of puppies. Um, there's also tax evasion going on as well. Again, something we don't think about in the veterinary community, but we know that revenue and customs officials are becoming increasingly uh, conscious of the amount of tax payments that are being evaded by illegal dealers uh, and puppy traders. And actually in 2019, the UK Revenue and Customs Department actually recovered over 5 million pounds from 257 dog breeders and traders as part of investigations into the illegal trade. So it's certainly big business. Um, uh, you know, and again, that is, that's brought with a lot of different illegality. Um, when we look at, again, what are the, the problems uh, more specifically, I already mentioned this a bit, but, you know, certainly there's poor welfare from start, you know, to, to the conditions in which these animals are bred, they're kept um, until, you know, the transport situation and until they're finally purchased. Um, there is certainly consumer deception, and my colleague Joanna Randall is going to talk a little bit more about this later, but we know that many of the, the paperwork that is associated with these puppies is fake, it's forged, uh, the origins of these dogs is often unknown or not disclosed, or uh, you know, traders might specifically just purposefully lie about where these dogs came from. Um, that creates some unfair competition with those that are trying to be responsible, that are, you know, responsible breeders. And there's also undoubtedly a public health risk. And my colleague, Dr. Ann, is going to talk about this in a minute, the risk of, of zoonotic diseases and infectious diseases in general. Um, we know also that the puppy trade, it's big business. Um, there's a lot of money involved, and it's also part of very organized crime uh, networks. And there are actually international networks of unscrupulous breeders. And unfortunately, some veterinarians are involved in this as well, um, and transporters that are connecting 
um, these sources of puppies with potential buyers. And this network spans many countries in a lot of cases. And despite a lot of campaigning over the years, there's still a public demand for puppies and the public is largely unaware of the way, you know, they should be buying puppies responsibly. And so the consequences of this are, you know, multiple, um, but oftentimes consumers are stuck with high veterinary bills and very traumatic experiences, particularly if, you know, the puppy that they purchased passes away or requires humane euthanasia due to disease or illness. Um, when we look at how are these puppies generally bought? So if I'm just a general consumer, and you, and you probably know this um, in, in whatever country you're joining us from, but if you want to buy a puppy and you go to Google and you type in, I want a puppy or buy a new puppy, you're gonna get, generally speaking, a classified ad site. So classified ad sites are the main sales channels. And these are perfect if you are involved in the illegal puppy trade because they're hardly regulated. They're very anonymous. You can hide behind a screen, create a fake profile, you can post an ad, and then you can disappear essentially once the puppy or the sale has been made. When we look at the scale of the trade, we know that it's massive, but it is impossible to accurately measure because of the illegality involved. We know that there are certain countries that are higher producing of these illegal puppies than others within the EU. That includes Bulgaria, Czech Republic, Hungary, just to name a few. Um, and then outside the EU, we also have source countries as well for many of these puppies, and that includes Russia, Serbia, and the Ukraine. Um, Dogs Trust actually did a, a really interesting investigation back in 2018 and found that many dealers in Eastern Europe, you know, which again are many of these source countries for the production of these puppies, um, have claimed to illegally transport dogs across to Western Europe. And we know that's a very common trafficking route. Um, one Hungarian dealer actually admitted to exporting around 400 puppies each week from Hungary. And so when you do some very simple math, <laughs> this equates to more than 20,000 puppies a year, providing an annual turnover or revenue of, of 20 million euros um, based on the average sale price of about 1,000 euros per puppy. So again, it is big business. When we look at the price of puppies, um, Again, an extremely lucrative trade with not a lot of disincentives for those that are involved. Um, puppies are being sold at very high prices. And unfortunately, those prices have only soared recently during the pandemic. I'm not gonna go through each of these breeds, but you can get a sense of, you know, just looking at the first one of, of Chow Chows that we've seen 134% increase in the price since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. When we think about, well, how does this affect the veterinary community? You know, there's certainly a trickle down effect and there's challenges that, that we face in practice. Um, when we have clients that end up with sick, unvaccinated puppies, um, they might have, you know, parvo, parvovirus or distemper. Um, they could even have rabies depending on where they come from. And so that creates a lot of, um, you know, ethical, uh, you know, issues. Um, but also, you know, we see complaints about medical costs being more and more prevalent, particularly in the media. Um, and, and unfortunately, we know that many of these puppies that require very intensive care and hospitalization, these are expensive cases to manage. Um, and, and certainly the owners are, are upset. Uh, and then sometimes that anger gets redirected on the clinician. Um, there's also certainly ethical considerations here. What does a veterinarian do or what action should they take if they come across, you know, documents that are clearly falsified, you know, the ages are clearly backdated to make the animal appear older. Um, the dogs haven't been microchipped. We don't know the origin. Um, you know, and again, it's it's often not, not the client's fault, right? They wanted a dog, they wanted a, a puppy. And so now they're kind of left in this situation. Um, and there's also an issue professionally that I, I did just want to mention here as well, very briefly, in that we do know that there are veterinarians involved uh, with uh, these rather unscrupulous breeders. Um, and so veterinarians are involved in helping facilitate the illegal trade, although I like to think it is, you know, extremely the minority. 
So with that um, very quick introduction, I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Ann Creel from FACAVA to speak specifically on what she's seeing in terms of the public health ramifications of this trade and the infectious disease risk. And Anne, I think you're on mute. Thanks a lot, Catherine. Uh, so we'll give the next presenter to Anne to take over. So go ahead, Anne. Yeah. So I, I want to welcome you on behalf of the GAVA uh, to this webinar on a subject that matters a lot to all uh, small animal practitioners out there. And I want to thank WZVA and Four Paws for the invitation to contribute. As a clinician and uh, working in the field, I wanted to talk about the zoonotic diseases. We know that they can cause a lot of problems after clients buy a new puppy. We see those problems more uh, and bigger affected on the online uh, sale of the puppies than when you buy a puppy with a professional breed. Do I have to click now? Sorry. Um, you can have the remote control so you can click. Sorry. Uh, it's okay. Well, I'll turn it for you. Just let me know. Oh, now it works. You're on mute. <laughs> yeah, every time I click, I'll unmute, unmute myself. <laughs> Sorry, so yeah. Next slide. Yeah. Uh, so why online online trade? How did it happen? Uh, what? Where did it come from? Uh, so as uh, Catherine already explained, the demand is much bigger than the supply. Um, and so this makes uh, a, a dog or a puppy economical, economically a very high value uh, product. Um, so during the pan pandemic uh, period, we saw a raise in the price of puppies that was really unbelievable. Puppies that normally costed 800 euros, now you could get them for 2,200, or up to 3,000 euros uh, for a mongrel or what we call now even a designer dog. Um, so on the other hand, the reproduction costs, uh, especially in the Eastern European countries are kept very low. And this goes with a big compromise in the welfare of the breeding dogs as well as the puppies. So puppy sale is really a booming business in Europe. And uh, let's say that uh, uh, for example, 400, 600,000 uh, dogs are traded per month in Europe. But profits should never take priority over animal health and welfare. Next slide, please. Okay, so what's the problem? The customer, as Catherine said, is not the expert. He doesn't know if he is buying a healthy puppy or a defective product. And uh, all the time, of a lot of times, they don't even know if they got a puppy from abroad. They, they have no clue. Um, and so the, a puppy is a consumer product. So it falls under the same legislation as, for instance, a washing machine. But if your washing, washing machine is broken, it's easily to exchange it and return it and get a refund, but it's not so easy when it comes to dogs. On the other hand, it's buying a puppy, uh, often an emotional and impulsive decision. Uh, there was a questionnaire and it seems that uh, buying, or it takes less time to buy a puppy online than to decide what kind of mobile phone you would like to, to buy. And on the other hand, the internet is easily accessible we have a huge supply on puppies. You don't have a waiting time, no questions asked. Um, whereas in pedigree dogs, often you have a long waiting list uh, for breeders to, ex to expect a, a litter. Breeders also ask you a lot of questions of you, about your family life and so on. So it's much easier to get a puppy 
from an online cell than from a, a breeder. Next, please. So animal health and welfare goes hand in hand with public health and well-being. Uh, but a wide range of pathogens influenced by regions and habitats can be hosted, carried, and transmitted to other animals and to people. Companion animal, animals have a greatly contribution to the well-being of human society, but they can also pass a lot of zoonotic diseases. At least 32 zoonotic diseases that we see in people come from dogs. Next, please. Next. For the bacterial pathogens, I want to light, uh, put a light on leptospirosis because we see it as an emerging global public health uh, problem. There are different serovars and vaccination only gives uh, an immunity for 12 months. So we see a lot of problems with the puppies uh, that are not vaccinated or only once vaccinated are only vaccinated what a uh, few of the serovars that are that they are on the market. And to me, in my personal experience, we even see more pro problems with leptospirosis by the cross-border uh, adoption dogs. So we see an increasing incidence of lepto as well as in the developing or in the developed countries. Next, please. Then we have that that nasty parasites, <laughs> and we have. I want to focus on Echinococcus. Uh, Echinococcus multilocularis is just just the tapeworm. We say it, we see it in dogs. We see it also in foxes, um, but it can lead to alveolar Echinococcus in humans. How can you get it? You just swallow the egg as a veterinarian or uh, also hunters in the field. Um, you, you, you have it on your hands, you take it in your mouth and there you go. And then dogs can carry it on their fur and it's in their feces sometimes if they are not treated well. So humans get those cyst-like tapeworm larvae that grow into the body, um, usually in the liver, but it can go to all other or uh, um, organs and it's very slow growing so you can live a long life half long life without any symptoms um, and in the dif differential diagnosis you will end up with a liver tumor or liver cirrhosis we as veterinarians are used to washing our ha hands maybe a thousand times a day so that's a good point and now in pandemic a lot of people are more aware what the uh, use of uh, antibacterial soap is for. Okay. And then we come to the next slide with the biggest pathogen is rabies. Next slide, please. So rabies is still killing about 70,000 people every year worldwide and 95% of the human cases are caused by bites of rabies infected dogs. So it has a long incubation time between three to eight weeks. And I'm sure in our country, my country in Belgium, we as vet are not recognizing rabies in the early stage. So if we get one on the table, we would miss it for sure. So EU has successfully eradicated rabies from most of its territory, but still it, it must be out there somewhere and I, I think it's it's something we really should be careful for. So uh, World Health Organizations, Food and Agriculture Organizations, World Organization of Animal Health and Global Alliance for Rabies Control aim to get to zero human death by rabies by 2030. So I think we as veterinarians have a huge role in, in this to, to, to come to this uh, to this point because rabies is for 100% preventable with vaccination so we we need to ensure that all cats and dogs are vaccinated and maybe think again about oral vaccination in 
for wildlife animals. Next, please. So what's the biggest issues with rabies and puppy trade? The pups can only get the first vaccination at 12, age of, 12 weeks of age, and then it takes 20 day, 21 days to get the immunization. So puppies are at least 15 weeks or a little bit older before they can cross borders. And that doesn't fit in the business plan of breeders. So what do they do? They uh, vaccinate the puppies too young because by changing the date of birth and the owners are not aware at all. And for us as veterinarians in the field, it's very, very difficult to see if the birth or the date of birth is in, com in compliance with how the puppy looks like because age that determination is still very under discussion even within the dental specialists um, because yeah we have a lot of discussions about this and we surely need to come to compromise how old is a puppy when his teeth are in that or that uh, uh, yeah phase of the evolution so it's still under a, a big discussion and it's a problem so next slide please so we, we the only thing that will work very well is prevention prevention is always better than cure so we need to include veterinary visits everywhere from the birth from the from the puppy until he's so he's in in at our consultation table we need to have a better control over the vaccinations and also anti Parasite treatment is very, very uh, needed. So, but nothing is will work without the control and the inspections needed. And to me, that's the biggest problem. Next, please. So working together to make online trades uh, of companion animals safer, that's what we aim for. And FICAVA, together with uh, FEE and other organizations, already wrote uh, lots of letters to uh, policymakers and online platforms. Um, because in the making of this presentation, I went back to the report of Four Paws from 2015-2016, where a lot of different problems were lighted, uh, like identification and re registration, fraud and vaccinations, fraud and microchips, problems with traces system as well. So being in the field every day, I'm not so sure uh, if a lot of these things changed. And so I can still list up the, these points in the next slide, please. Another thing that I nearly forgot <laughs> is that we should make people aware uh, what to do before. Uh, to buy a puppy. So contact your vet before buying a puppy. And that's uh, a new uh, questionnaire. We will be uh, on the FICAV and FEE website very soon. Um, it's a questionnaire that people can come in to the consultation, to the veterinary clinic, ask them, fill them in, and then together with the veterinarian, you can talk about um, what puppy would fit best in your family and where do I best go and buy a puppy? So aware, making people aware of the problems that we just talked about is very important as well. And then the next slide. So this is the list of the points that were set up already in 2015, 2016 by four parts. So I still think a lot of these are uh, didn't change a lot. So let's try together to make dog trade a respectful. So just bear with us for a couple of minutes while we reset um, Joanna's audio. Okay, 
<laughs> so here I was um, talking about illegal online puppy sales. So I'm going to assume maybe you didn't hear what I was saying at this slide. So I'll begin again. Um, yeah, so Four Paws's work has really focused on the illegal online puppy trade, because like Catherine said at the beginning, this is where the problem really of, you know, the cruelty and the deception and the hidden elements of the illegal puppy trade really meets the, um, the public, really comes into contact with potential buyers. So this is the area where we know that we can have an impact on when we're not necessarily able to like go into these breeding facilities and seek them out behind the scenes and crack down on them that way. We can definitely work with their main sales channels, which are the classified ad sites. And these are websites which operate all over the world. Um, if you're in Europe, you're probably um, familiar with either Gumtree or eBay or um, Marked Plats are kind of the big ones across the EU. And um, we know that around 400,000 dogs and around another 80,000 cats are advertised on classified websites in the EU every day. Um, in Spain alone, um, I think this was the EU Dog and Cat Alliance did some research research recently and found around 50,000 dog adverts being placed on the main classified ad sites in Spain on any given day um, last year. And one of those individual sellers was found to have around 523 simultaneously live adverts on the classified ad sites. So this is just to give you an idea of kind of the deception and anonymity that um, lies behind classified ad sites for animals. And you know, it's one thing when someone wants to remain anonymous when they're selling a, a, a pair of secondhand shoes that they wore to their prom. But when they're selling a living, breathing, sentient, animal um, that could potentially die in the arms of the person who has purchased it days later from, you know, parvo or distemper, um, then it's a whole other issue, really. It's, it's a very different level of seriousness when it comes to consumer fraud. And um, likewise, this is some four pause research, again, just in Germany, just to give you a couple of case examples. Um, we have been um, measuring the rates of online uh, dog and puppy ads that have been placed pretty much since the online, pretty much since the start of um, the pandemic last year and around March. Um, so to kind of give you an idea of whether or not lockdown affected um, the rate of advertisements online, we can kind of see here um, when I went on to the three main classified ad sites in Germany. Last week, we, we saw about 75,000 dogs advertised. And at around the same time last year, that was still around 83,000. Um, so yeah, the lockdown and the pandemic did not disincentivize puppy sales. If anything, when you could see how um, uh, much money could be made from selling puppies online. If anything, it led to a booming trade. I'm just going to quickly give you a bit more insight into Four Paws' campaign approach so you can kind of understand why we've decided to focus on um, focusing on improving the online pet trade um, now. We, of course, have tried many public awareness campaigns and working with the media. We do extensive investigations and research and work with victims as well. Public awareness is incredibly important, you know, especially in the sense of informing people about how to responsibly buy a puppy or adopt a puppy. Um, you know, that can be really empowering for people. And it certainly led to a great deal of attention that's been brought to this issue in, in recent years. But it's not enough on its own to stop the illegal puppy trade. Otherwise, it would have stopped by now, because I can tell you as a campaigner, there's been a lot of work done in this area. So this is why it's also important for us to be really working with regulatory bodies and also with the industry itself. So the online classifieds um, wherein these, these adverts can be placed. So um, in terms of policy change, we work both with and within the EU. So we're talking about um, improving regulations such as the Animal Health Law and the Digital Services Act that are EU regulations, but also working um, at the national levels, especially in several uh, EU countries where we have um, programs offices. And of course, improving traceability. And this is really where we have moved towards a very large part of our work. In terms of recognizing the need to verify the identity the identities of people who are selling these animals online. And so we've developed something that we call the Four Paws Model Solution, which is basically a way of ending the illegal online puppy trade. And I I have to kind of forewarn you at this point, you know, my presentation, I'm not a vet veterinarian, but I am going to get into quite complex territory pretty soon. 
Python and some IT wizardry that I even I don't fully understand after having worked on this for several years now. Um, but don't worry because I really invite the opportunity to send um, more information and details about how veterinarians can take action and really contribute to ending the illegal online puppy trade. And I can provide that. I'd be really happy to provide that to Asava or even Vakava after this um, presentation so we can really break it down for you. Now, this is what we're working on at the moment, this four pause model solution. And in this system, we really envisage a safe online trade that blocks market access for illegal puppy dealers. And in this system, only registered dogs should be able to be advertised by traceable sellers. So we partnered up some time ago with a body called EuroPetNet. And you may have heard of EuroPetNet. They're a central European reference registry. And their, their main or original purpose is to kind of bring together INR or microchipping databases all together under one kind of umbrella database um, for the purpose of pet reunification. So if you're traveling around Europe and you want to take your dog with you and your dog goes missing in France, but you're from um, Germany, um, the idea is that anyone who finds that dog will be able to scan their microchip, search for it on EuroPetNet and go back and discover then via the EuroPetNet database where that dog originated from, at least which database they were registered to and thereby which country. And then you can get in touch with that database and, and you know, get the actual owner's details and reunite their dog. But what we realized with EuroPetNet is that they've got this handy kind of um, reference database wherein around 50% of um, pet registration databases from 26 countries are currently registered. And they have about 100 million data files on pets from around Europe. So that's a tremendous source of information right there. And this is why we really wanted to work with EuroPetNet on developing this technical solution. And this solution we are calling EuroPetNet's Pet Safe. So only registered dogs can be advertised online by traceable sellers. And the benefits of this are that it's a simple solution for classified sites and users. So quite often, you know, we'd be going to classified ad sites, imploring them to, to install some kind of seller verification so that we can at least trace the people who are advertising these puppies. But it was kind of beyond, you know, an individual classified ad site's ability to do this. So we've developed it for them with EuroPetNet. Um, under this solution as well, all puppies must be registered before sale. This means that responsible sellers who do register their puppies can still sell online, but illegal dealers, those who don't want to have their name and contact details registered in a database somewhere, those who want to remain anonymous will lose access. They simply will be, will be blocked from being able to place an ad online. I'm going to tell you how this system actually works in a, in a minute. With this system, authorities can trace puppies and sellers in the event of illegal activities. It increases consumer protection and improves animal welfare. And the governments can ensure that the correct tax is being paid and not avoided as well. So this system basically ticks all those boxes for what we deemed as being needed and those key problems that have arisen through the illegal puppy trade. But ultimately, this isn't just about blocking illegal dealers from accessing. This isn't just about tracing them when illegal activities take place, um, when a puppy becomes sick and somebody wants to find the person who sold it to them or find, or if a disease outbreak happens um, and you need to be able to identify the origin of the puppy. Ultimately, what this system is designed to do is disincentivize illegal dealers from actually wanting to access the marketplace because the punishments will be just too severe and the risk they take will be be too high to place an ad online. In that way, they're being driven out of the marketplace. And if there's no way that they can sell their product without being caught, they're simply, hopefully, not going to want to participate in the illegal puppy trade. And that's when we're going to see the closure of you know, the puppy farming systems and the cruel breeding practices and the transportation that we associate um, with the illegal pet trade. I'm going to talk to you about the EU animal health law. Now, how this all ties in with it. So the key is in the title of this, of this regulation. It's an animal health law. And it's designed basically to um, provide prevention, protection, and control measures against transmissible animal diseases. And it now applies in every EU member state since last month. Um, and for all the reasons that Anne went through before, 
Unsurprisingly, dog breeders and sellers have been identified by the EU as being a particularly risky activity where masses of animals are brought together into close confinement for the purpose of being exported or sold even within their state. So for that reason, all dog breeders sellers and shelters need to register their establishments with their national competent authorities um, and if you're exporting you need to seek further approvals as well. Um, so it, here is the actual recital from the animal health law so you can see for yourself that the EU has acknowledged the the, the zoonotic health risk and the and the, the spreadable diseases um, that are rife within dog breeding and sales and they've put in, in place this regulation to try and um, emit that risk. So now I've already mentioned, hopefully you're keeping count, three potential to create a fully traceable online puppy trade. We've got the national competent authority registries of the breeder and seller establishments that are now a requirement from the animal health law. You've got the individual national microchipping databases that people register their puppies to and you know, register themselves as owners. Um, and then you've got EuroPetNet, this, this oversight registry as well. So you've got three potential data points here for being able to trace both the origins of, of puppies around Europe and the people involved in their breeding and sale. So Four Paws basically sat down and said, what if we connected all these data points and then somehow managed to connect that information with classified ad sites as well? So yes, it's getting a bit complicated already, but don't worry, I've got an infographic. So with this process, authorities can identify the origin of any animal as well as involve stakeholders. And here you've got, you know, a kind of a, a simplified lifespan of a dog. You'll have, um, you know, a dog who is um, microchipped and registered by a vet um, for the breeder who should be, in our view, um, the first registered keeper. That breeder then may work through a third party dealer or a seller or the dog may end up at a shelter before then going on to their first owner, second owner and so on. All these people in our vision should be included in these national pet microchipping databases. That's the first data point there. The second data point is the register for dog breeding and selling establishments. And we, we, you know, the breeder and the seller as part of the animal health law will be given a unique registration number. And so this is what um, we want to then have uh, basically connected to the national pet microchipping registration databases. EuroPetNet comes in as kind of an overview site with these national pet microchipping databases who feed certain kinds of information, primarily the microchip numbers and not any personal data into EuroPetNet. But EuroPetNet have then and are in the process of developing something called an application programming interface, an API, which connects their data with classified ad sites. So classified ad sites will then be able to verify pet registration via automated checks with pet registration databases. And this is kind of what it will look like um, from the point of view of the user. So a seller will go onto a classified ad site, enter in the pet microchip number as they're filling in a form to place that ad um, and some contact details. The PetSafe API will then connect that information um, with the EuroPetNet database. And if that microchip number and the contact details match up and they can verify that you are the registered keeper of that animal, you'll be allowed to place the ad. If your details do not match up with that microchip number, you will be blocked from placing that ad. You will simply not be allowed to place that ad. So this is how we can ensure anyone selling an animal online is the registered keeper of that animal, but also has their details somewhere in a database that verifies their identity. And there is, there's, you know, other things that can come out with your pet nets pet safe as well. Like we can add extra information in there about the dog and about the seller as well. In our ideal system, we would want those establishment registration numbers to also be provided as part of this. So there are additional things needed for the checks. I'm going to skip over a few of these bits. So just in the interest of time that we've lost. Um, 
and talk a little bit more about lobbying opportunities that come up because this is where I think um, uh, veterinarians can play a key role. Obviously, in this system that we've envisioned, EU-wide mandatory INR or microchipping and registration of microchips is needed across all of the EU. And you can see in this map on the right-hand side here, the dark blue countries are the ones that do not have mandatory INR of dogs yet. And, you know, there is hope on the horizon for um, Lithuania, Czech Republic and Finland. They all have pieces of legislation going through at the moment. Um, the big one that most people seem to get surprised about is Germany. Um, and for very complicated reasons, I could give another 45-minute presentation about Germany does not have mandatory INR for dogs and is very at the national level and is very unlikely to do it without some gentle pressure at the EU level. So this is why we are um, calling for a delegated act under the animal health law for mandatory EU-wide INR um, in harmonized and compatible systems. We really need mandatory identification and registration for full traceability across the entire EU to be possible. Now, what can veterinarians do? So these are my last couple of slides and I, I'm, I'm more than happy to answer questions about other areas of EU lobbying if we do have time at the end of this. But just to summarize, you know, the reason why um, Catherine and myself really wanted to take some time and speak with Wasava and veterinarians today is because your experience and stories as individuals and as a sector can be a powerful mechanism for change. You're a respected field and we know that the voice of veterinarians have a role in convincing governments of the need for a full fully regulated traceable online pet trade. Um, so one of the first things you can do is raise awareness of importance of INR for responsible pet ownership. So encourage um, uh, pet owners to register if um, they haven't. Um, raise awareness amongst your clients about the risks of buying a puppy online. And Four Paws can certainly share some campaigning materials for you. Um, if you're online as a vet, vet influencer, please share our hashtag tracing the trade and our website, which details more about um, the four paws um, model solution. And until identity verification is required by all INR databases, we need that data going into the pet microchipping databases to be as reliable as possible. So if you are responsible um, for inputting information into pet microchip databases, please ensure that data is reliable. Um, you can, of course, report suspected and unscrupulous dealers or sellers or breeders as well. Please, as a first point, always report them to the police or trading standards or the council, whatever authority you have within your country. And you can also report it to Four Paws. We have a, um, a confidential online reporting form. If you go onto our website um, and search report illegal puppy traders, you'll be invited to send us um, any information that you might have so our investigators can look into it. And finally, I want to just briefly, oh, actually, first of all, if you're if you're sitting there at your screen and wanting something to do straight away, we actually have a Digital Services Act campaign film running at the moment, which calls for a strengthening of the Digital Services Act, which is um, under review at the moment. Um, you can check out our campaign link and um, share the films. I'm happy to provide a link to those later on um, if someone hasn't already done it in the, in the chat box for me. Um, and this features practicing vets from around Europe as well who have really kindly contribu contributed to this campaign film to raise awareness about the need for regulating the online pet trade. I'm really promising to wrap up at this point now, Nat. So how can veterinary associations help? So you can help by lobbying the European Commission for a Delegated Act for Mandatory INR. We're going to be drafting a joint letter and we're inviting co-signatories from supporting organisations um, and other supporting companies and associations and maybe even one or two celebrities to take part in this action. Um, and we'd really like to warmly invite Wasava and Fakava as well to participate participate in this action and any other veterinary associations operating at the national levels as well are also welcome to join um, because we know your voice and your influence and your experiences can really um, help with that. Promote pet safe um, in order to block illegal puppy dealers from using classified ad, si ad sites and wherever possible, if you're doing any kind of um, consultation work for governments or participating in inquiries, please do mention that we have a system ready to go um, that will help block illegal traders from the online marketplace. And of course, raise awareness whenever possible. We're gonna be launching a new public awareness campaign at the end of this summer. Um, and I'd be really happy to share materials from that as well, which you can share either online or in clinic. And 
Just a final thing to say, um, a big thank you to Wasava as well for um, your endorsement of the Four Paws model solution for ending the illegal online puppy trade. Um, we're so pleased and delighted to have you on our side and, and to be working together with you to help end this cruel trade. If you want more information about this and, and the pet safe scheme, you can visit our website fourpaws.org forward slash tracing the trade and you can download our report for free. Oh my gosh, I only ran three minutes over time, but thank you so much for your attention, everybody. And these are my contact details if anybody would like more information. All right, so thank you very much, uh, Joanna. And also thank you to our previous uh, presenters Anne and Catherine as well. Uh, seems like there's lots of questions that's coming in. So let's not wait too long. Let's jump in and, and start some of the questions. So um, I think since we are still on the EuropetNet uh, talk, just fresh uh, off it, let's start with those questions. So is, is one of the questions um, is that, is EuropetNet a unique database for microchips for all of EU? And is it also a marketplace? No, so EuropetNet is basically an umbrella database. Um, it has around 100 million data files on pets. For, I think it represents around 50% of the national um, level microchipping um, databases uh, around Europe at the moment. So yes, um, you can become a vol if you uh, are running a INR database. Um, so for example, Petlog in the UK, um, you can become a member of EuropetNet and voluntarily provide that data that you have on the pets within your database to EuroPetNet. Um, they're not they're not selling animals online. They're basically an umbrella or a reference registry for national um, microchipping databases. And yes, in order to participate in this pet safe scheme, um, membership of EuroPetNet is critical so that you can actually be giving them your data and it's all GDPR compliant that way as well. Um, so this is another part of our work is trying to convince INR databases to join EuroPetNet so that they can volunteer in the system. Uh, great. So we have another question about uh, registering breeders. <clears throat> How do we force breeders to register their puppies? Is there a fine if they don't register them? Uh, for example, in France, some hunters are breeding their own dogs and actually giving, giving them away to friends. So it's different in every country, obviously, at what point um, you need to register as a breeder. So, for example, in England, where I am, um, anyone um, who is um, in the business of selling and breeding um, dogs must register with their local council and get a license to do so. But that's not the same. And it's it's not regulated at the EU level. The animal health law, to be honest, I could go into this rages, but it's it's kind of vague. And this is where if EU regulations are in any way vague, members the states will jump on that opportunity to take, you know, take advantage of that vagueness and then interpret the legislation however they want. Um, so from our point of view, yes, absolutely. Anyone breeding a dog for the purpose of selling a dog um, should be registered from the very first puppy bred onward. Um, but that is different from country to country, unfortunately. And, and this is one of the things that we would like to see really spelled out more clearly in the animal health law is from at what point um, must uh, breeders be registered? Uh, the next question is about cats and whether the pet safe apply to cats or does it only apply to dogs? And, and also, would it apply to outside of EU? Okay, so yeah, really good questions. And we do get asked this um, quite often, these two questions. Um, in theory, yes to both. Yes, it could apply to any animal that is microchipped and then being sold online. So yes, it could apply to cats. It could apply to ferrets as well. Um, those are the animals that are covered under the animal health law because they are rabies prone species. Um, at the moment, we focus our work and on developing the pet safe system only for dogs. And the reason why we do that is because we have those data points available to us. And it's the most comprehensively available data for any companion animal. And also because the puppy trade 
avoid like you know Catherine and Anne went through is a huge risk you know it's a risk for so many reasons and it's you know intensely profitable and is international organized crime so it needs an urgent solution um, so as an animal charity we kind of need to focus on on one species for this moment but in theory yes absolutely it could apply to cats and um, same uh, answer basically for if it can if it can be a can, so long as those data points are available, we can definitely have a similar connecting system um, to provide traceability of the online trade. But, you know, in Europe, we do have those data points in existence. We've got to do a lot more groundwork and lobbying and public awareness raising in other regions of the world, I think, before we can get anywhere close to where Europe is. Um, you know, we, we do have quite a lot of on the ground work happening in Southeast Asia. And we've certainly noticed and seen a need for um, uh, more responsible pet ownership and awareness of microchipping of pets in Southeast Asia in particular, where there's a booming um, increase in, in um, pet ownership at the moment. So that might be a region that we look at um, over the next few years. Cool. Can't wait for you to come over to this side mm, of the world. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> um, re regarding a passport for every pup that's born in, in, in Europe, uh, is the system ready to do that, like to give every pup born a passport? Or, and currently, how many countries are, on, are giving uh, pet passports to puppies from birth? Gosh, that's a good question. And you know what? I don't actually know the answer to that. My, my understanding is that pet passports are issued if an animal is... A um, intended for uh, for travel, you know, throughout the EU. Um, so if a puppy is being sold uh, with the intention of being exported, they'll be issued a pet passport by the veterinarian at the time that that puppy is um, kind of microchipped and, and, and registered. Um, but that is not necessarily the case for every single puppy because not every single puppy is going to be traveling across borders. And it gets even more complicated, of course, now because um, as the UK has left um, the EU, you know, it, it's it, we've got a whole more complicated system there now for bringing um, animals in and out of the UK too. Um, so I think, yeah, I think maybe I would say the system is ready to be able to do that um, but it's whether or not it's really um, deemed necessary by authorities I think is the real question. Cool. Um, maybe we have a question for Anne regarding some disease control questions uh, as particularly rabies I think it's a very popular question so the question is that is rabies still, does rabies still exist in Europe, especially within the wildlife or the wild fauna? Uh, for example, an example given is wild foxes in Germany. Yeah, while I was reading through again all the information about rabies to put in this uh, PowerPoint, um, it seems that we don't have the rabies free and the rabies, uh, the rabies countries. So now we have the classification into high risk and uh, no or lower risk. So does that mean that uh, there is that there must be there must be rabies in some countries in the wildlife wildlife for sure? So I think we can never say that dogs can come in without any risk if they are not well vaccinated on the on the right date, because that's the problem. Pups are younger, they on, on their official passports, they are completely, if you check the dates, it, it, it fits perfectly. And then you look at the teeth and then you think, hmm. And then, then there is nobody who can help you. you. We take pictures, we send them off to the, to the Ministry of uh, Animal Welfare in, in, uh, in Belgium, and then you get no reply, there is no, yeah, it's it's a to me it's a, a big risk, and what I do personally in practice, if I see the puppy and I see the passport and I think hmm this is not matching, I put on gloves immediately, and then the owner's eyes go, what are you doing? And then I say yeah, maybe this puppy can have rabies. I'm not going to take a risk, and then you see them thinking, but then it's already too late. So. In every meeting I give on this subject, I always say there will be there, there will be a problem one, one day or, the, or another, and then it's too late, and it's it's a shame. 
So um, yeah, I'm not sure. I, I think nobody will answer this question for real. Uh, yeah, I have I have no clue. I have no clue. But in the figures you find on the internet, Europe is rabies free nearly everywhere. Yeah. I can maybe just build on that to say that the um, Commissioner for Animal Welfare last year, there was a motion for a resolution um, calling for regulation of the online pet trade. And the Commissioner basically um, denied that rabies was um, a significant risk um, from the illegal pet trade. And it is kind of contradictory because it's there in the animal health law that they do pose a significant, this industry does pose a significant disease risk or a not insignificant disease risk. And so for that, reason um, it needs to fall under the animal health law and be regulated and have these establishments registered so they've acknowledged it in the regulation but not to the extent that they want to actually really go a step forward yet and regulate the online trade and really prevent these these pup you know prevent the incentive there you disincentivize the sale of puppies from um, uh, potentially rabies endemic countries I mean if you look at that INR map that I that I showed um, just a minute ago you can see that you've got potentially a direct route from countries like Serbia into the EU where it can then end up in in you know countries where there isn't mandatory INR from Russia or Belarus or Ukraine into Poland. Um, and we certainly heard cases of um, puppies coming in from Russia um, into um, Western Europe. And, you know, who knows if they're even originated in Russia. We've had, um, you know, rumors of, of um, uh, Kyrgyzstan even and puppies just from all over the, all over the world ending up in Europe. And I, I'm with you, Anne. I agree. You know, do we have to wait for a rabies outbreak? break and for people to start dying before the EU really starts taking this issue seriously. I sincerely hope not. I really do hope not. But um, this is why we need to be putting that pressure on the EU. And right now, when this animal health law has come into effect, and we know that we can really crack down on it. Can I can I give a further comment on that? Because yes, sure. that's where I think that the passport for every puppy who is born in Europe from birth could make a, a great difference because then you know where where it comes from and not only to one page or two pages for the for the owners no in belgium we have six places to put the uh, owners one one by one so the breeder the first buyer blah 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 so there are six uh, spaces where you can put and and they have to sign it as well so i think it's not the microchipping is not enough really it's not enough because you, you see puppies coming from they 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 come from Gung, Hungary and they they the first uh, stop they make is in Czechia there they get their uh, passport and the vaccinations then they come to the Netherlands and then they come to Belgium so and and then we we see those those passports and we only see one owner it doesn't make sense so if the puppies get all over Europe, the passport from the day they get their first vaccination or their microchip at the same day, then you have two numbers to check and the microchip and the passport number. So, and in Belgium, the passport number comes with the, or the microchip number comes with a unique passport number. So they link together. And we do that already for many, many years and it works. So I never understood <laughs> why nobody makes the passport also mandatory. That's my personal opinion. So I think we could, could go or we, we would, we have to go a step further really to solve the problem. Awesome, good answers. Um, we have quite a few questions or, or prompts for discussion on the role of vets. So maybe I'll, I'll just read some, some aloud. Um, so, vets are involved in, in banning the illegal trade of puppies, as we are talking about here now. But on the other hand, they are also critical to breeding pedigrees and uh, breeding pedigree dogs. And clients don't know how to find healthy puppies. Um, is, is one of the problems in it. So, one of the question, one of the Thing that has been raised, and uh, this can be open for anybody to answer, is is the involvement of more vets in the pedigree dog breeding actually desirable to further improve the pedigree dog breeding? 
Oh gosh, Anne, do you want to take that one <laughs> as a vet? Me or, me or Catherine, I don't know, because I'm, I'm a vet in the field as well, and I was involved uh, a long time in the pedigree club uh, for hips and elbow dysplasia. I was uh, for long for 15 years. I was uh, president of the Belgium uh, National um, Authority for uh, screening hips and elbows. Um, sometimes I say to my my clients who want to buy a puppy that I cannot be sure that a pedigree puppy is so much more healthy than another puppy. And I think there is nothing else to say. The only advantage of a pedigree puppy is that you have some information about his parents and uh, of the tests that has been done. Um, so then you are a little bit stronger uh, if you want to go to court <laughs> and, to, uh, and you want to get uh, a, dis in a discussion with the breeder. So if, if the breeder sells you a dog and he says, oh, yes, uh, he, has per he, will be, he will have perfectly hips. And when he's six or seven months, it seems that he doesn't have perfectly hips. Uh, then you are a little bit stronger um, and you stand stronger. But... I always say it's it's it, it's not cars, it's not it's not washing machines we sell. It's mm. yeah, it's 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 a living material. So um, the one who says who breeds the perfect dog, um, yeah, I want to meet that guy because uh, I think it's not possible. And you can have a perfect mongrel who has no complaints, and you can have a perfect pedigree dog. And if you have if you're unlucky, he can have all sorts of kind of smaller or bigger issues. So I don't think we have to go for the perfect dog. We have to go for the healthy dog, whatever that uh, takes to come there. And um, yeah, that's my opinion. I, I'm I'm not in, in I'm not in favor for only pedigree dogs. I like the the mongrels, but I do I have a problem with designer dogs. But that's another another uh, uh, discussion. Right. Catherine, do you have anything to add to it, to that discussion? Yeah, I mean, I think Anne covered it really nicely. I think veterinarians do play a role in responsible breeding. You know, we do play a role in, you know, breed standards and ensuring the health and welfare of dogs, both mongrel and purebred. So I do think there is, you know, certainly a role for veterinarians in ensuring responsible breeding. However, um, I think this is such a multifaceted issue that it involves, you know, again, not only, uh, you know, the involvement of the clinical veterinarian, but it also involves industry response and at a regulatory level. So while I do think that, yes, we do play a role, I, I'm not sure that, you know, that's going to be the kind of the central component to really eliminating the online trade specifically. Speaking about elimination, there is one question about talk completely banning dog breeding or just all kinds of breeding, including responsible breeding. Do you think that's feasible? I think this is probably um, a question prompted by a lot of um, work for, by um, animal welfare or animal rights NGOs. Um, you know, if the question is, is it feasible? Uh, I think the answer is, well, I mean, anything's feasible, but is it is it likely to happen in our lifetime? I think the answer is no. Um, I, I can only speak on behalf of Four Paws. And as an animal welfare organization that has been working on um, issues around um, dog breeding and selling and responsible acquisition of pets for, for some 15 years now, you know, we've really learned that there... Um, you know, I'm a dog lover myself. I have, uh, you know, a rescue dog, but I can't imagine living life without one. And if, if there was an end to breeding of dogs um, per se, you would need um, a great deal of public support for that. And I think the irony of the existence of this cruel trade is that it exists 
it's because people love dogs. People want dogs. People want to share their lives with dogs. They want them around them. So you're kind of having to go in and battle this natural intrinsic love for these animals that ironically and sadly leads to a great deal of suffering and cruelty. Um, and and of course, we end up with, you know, millions of animals ending up relinquished as well because they end up in irresponsible homes. The illegal puppy trade, you know, this kind of um, mass provision supply of puppies to meet this huge demand is really underpinning a lot of the suffering and the cruelty that I think is a concern of most animal rights and welfare organisations. Um, and so this is why our approach is really to try and take this multi-sectoral, multi-approach to it uh, of raising public awareness and really needing to inform buyers, A, should you have a dog just because you want one? Are you able to provide the right home for this dog or this particular breed or type of dog? Um, and are you prepared for the responsibilities responsibilities that come with that and a legal dealer will say yes yes you are here's your dog that'll be 3,000 euros please and a responsible breeder will hopefully say mm, this dog isn't for you maybe come again another day um wait for a well-bred dog so you know <sighs> Is it feasible to ban all breeding? Sure, as a campaigner, I'm optimistic anything's feasible, but is it likely and is it really needed? I don't think so. Um, but I know that other animal groups and other um, you know, activists would, would disagree with me on that point. And I think it is an important discussion to have personally and co to continually challenge ourselves with these kinds of questions. Otherwise, you know, we're not being progressive. Cool. So moving on to another question. Uh, this is related to stray dogs relocation. There are cases where puppies are being sold under the cover of stray dogs relocation. Is this a known problem and how can it be tackled? Yeah, that's a, that's a really known problem. And I think um, maybe I'll just say, I'm, I'm sure Anne or Catherine probably want to, to make a comment on this as well. Um, but I will just quickly say that under the EU animal health law, uh, anyone um, wanting to do any kind of cross-border um, rehoming of, of dogs um, must also be registered and approved by their competent authority to do so. So potentially this system that we're developing can also provide traceability around that, um, that field as well of, of cross-border rehoming across the EU. Um, so I just wanted to mention that, but, I, but I'm sure um, our veterinarians will have thoughts on this matter as well. Catherine, you first. <laughs> yeah, mute, uh, Catherine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry, no, go ahead, Anne. I can uh, follow up. Yeah, in Belgium, uh, we see that more and more as a problem. Uh, so, and the the, the cause of the problem is if you want to adopt a dog in, from a Belgium shelter, you have to fill in all these lists and questions like you have to do with pedigree breeders as well. And then you end up without a dog. So because they don't think you're fit enough to keep a dog. So then people come home, they open their laptop, they go to Romanian shelter and within three or four days they have a dog on their in their garden and uh, yeah, it does, they don't have to pay more than 170 euros and everybody is happy. And uh, yeah. And then you see those dogs, they walk on the leash from day one. Uh, they know sit, uh, go down, they know every command. And then the owner says, yeah, but he was tied up in the woods uh, with a small, uh, yeah, yeah, and he was completely uh, uh, alone. And then I think, okay. So <laughs> I must say that I lose some clients, I think every month, five or more, because I cannot stand these, <laughs> these discussions. And I'm mostly very open to my clients as well. And so they, they take it. Or, or they leave, but it's a really, really big problem because those dogs, you ha you have the ones who don't come from a shelter and you have the ones who come from a shelter and those are very frightened. They have behavior problems. Uh, they are a risk for the, for the families because most of the families, it's their first dog. They don't know how, how to act with a dog. And I think it's, a re it's even 
maybe even a bigger problem than the, the, the puppy cell, in my opinion. It's more dangerous. Yeah, I'll just add to that, um, coming at this from a bit of a different angle, that this really falls under the umbrella of the general discussion regarding international dog adoption, international dog transport, which again, it's a, it's a whole presentation in and of itself. Um, and I think uh, having been involved specifically in Asia um, with international dog transport, I think there are ways to do it responsibly and there are a lot of ways to do it irresponsibly and a lot of corners that are caught primarily due to the sheer cost of you know, the transport and the logistics and the permits and when I've seen it done most successfully is when it's done by responsible organizations that have, you know, the expertise, the, you know, the veterinary expertise, the logistical expertise, um, and they can work with organizations in the importing country, uh, you know, to make sure that behavioral concerns are, you know, addressed, that there is a mechanism in place for when these adoptions maybe don't work out. Um, but when they're done to individuals that, again, as Anne just mentioned, that are, you know, unequipped to, to manage, this might be their first dog and the dog doesn't maybe know how to walk on a lead or has, you know, these behavioral issues, you know, that, that weren't uh, addressed up front, communicated up front, um, that's where we have issues. So, while I do think that you know international dog transport can be fraught with 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 obvious issues, both from a medical and behavioral standpoint and a logistical standpoint, um, you know there are instances where it can be done responsibly. But undoubtedly, this is an issue, and I think it will be, you know, continue to to be an issue and a topic for debate uh, in the veterinary field years to come. All right, thank you. So we have one last question. Maybe we'll also end it on a po more positive note. Uh, that pe people like vets who are professionals in dog welfare, but not just vets. Uh, for example, there's also trainers and dog behaviorists, for example. So how can this group of people help to support this work? I mean, it would be the same um, kind of three points that I, that I mentioned for veterinarians, like awareness raising for sure. You know, once people have got a dog, I think at that point they start seeking out dog trainers and behaviorists and things like that. But these are all respected fields. And for them to kind of just acknowledge that they could have a critical role to play if they're seeing the repercussions of the illegal pu um, puppy trade, if they've had any experiences, if they think they may have um, information about but, um, illegal traders, please do reach out to Four Paws. Go to our website, four-paws.org, and you can use our online reporting system. Um, and that information will be shared with our investigators who can then follow up um, and raise awareness with your clients about how to responsibly buy a puppy online. What are the signs to look out for? Um, and again, we have information on our Four Paws website that we can provide as well around this. And whenever you have the opportunity to kind of call for regulation of the online um, pet trade, please do so, whether it's, you know, if you're uh, issuing a response for um, a public inquiry or a consultation with your national government, um, please do take that opportunity to mention it. And, you know, um, and now I don't know if it's okay to share um, my contact details with everyone once more, or if um, you'd prefer to share some Wasava contact details, perhaps, um, but you can always get in touch with us. And, and um, we'd be very, very happy to supply anyone with lobbying materials or any kind of um, content that you might want to share. So we will, we will definitely share the link uh, where you can get more information on this uh, issue here and also what to do with solutions and, and all and also do follow us on our social media so you can follow uh, Wasawa's social media or Four Paws social media or even Fukawa's social media um, and what we'll do is uh, I think we'll end this webinar for now so thanks a lot to all our speakers and thank you for all the participants who joined us from the start or from wherever you are uh, thanks a lot for, for coming in. This webinar is also recorded, so again, you can go, go through it or share with your friends and spread the news of this trade and also the solutions in terms of what we can do for it. So thank you a lot. Thank you to participants again.